I'm Pat Fritz. I'm chair of the event support committee. And we are asking for help from the audience to evaluate the technical aspect of things. <laughs> the lights, like, <laughs> I'm standing in front of the camera, I guess. <laughs> but how's the sound, how's the lighting, um, PowerPoint presentation, not the content of the program. You've got some wonderful presenters here. So you have a sheet of paper on your chair with some questions on it, and if you would put it in the box, outside the door. Uh, when you leave, that would be great. It will be great help to us. Thank you. So you guys are going to rate us when it's over? Yeah. yeah. So, if any of you are in doubt, please come up afterwards and we can have a little Say a take, perhaps a little conversation about it. And I encourage you to rate me and Paul separately. <laughs> That's a good idea. And then Clay over here on his own as well. So <laughs> Yeah, we gotta keep Clay out of this. Clay, you stay back there. Where are you, Clay? He's right over here. Oh, I thought you'd be doing your camel. Oh, okay. Okay, Clay's here too. All right. Here I'm, you go. I'm Jenny Stimson and I'm on the neighborhoods committee. <laughs> And I have been very fortunate to get to spend a little bit of time, I'll say, with these characters. <laughs> with um, these, actually, people who have given such a gift over time to us about learning about the history of Seattle. And when I heard that this book was coming out, the very first day I said, we've got to get them at Horizon House to come and share with us about their work and about their experience over time in producing these things. So um, Laura Weiss, who's in the back, is the chair of the Neighborhoods Committee, and she is just such a fabulous uh, support to this work. She is wonderful. And the people in the front row here are members of the Neighborhoods Committee who, when I said we need people to bring water to do this and that, they immediately signed up to do that work. So. As many of you know, working here at Horizon House or as a resident and doing things, there's so much wonderful support that um, it's easy to do this work. So one of my good friends is Clay Gills. And Clay got involved in this project of producing the book. So he's going to introduce um, the two speakers. But I want to tell you, it's the repartee between Paul and Jean. That is what we're going to enjoy this evening. So you'll give us an energy. Yes, it's correct. I'm not. It's, uh, it's, they're wonderful. What did you say? Where is Jean? He's right here. This is Jean. So thank you all for coming here. I really appreciate being here with these guys. But I also just appreciate being here. I was following your lead, Jim. I'm particularly glad to be here at Horizon House, where we've had so many programs here over the past four or five years. And uh, Ginny's a dear friend, and for her to set this up and to have all of the support of the committee has been great. Um, I have been active in, uh, I guess you would have to say West Seattle history, although some, in some ways broader Seattle history, uh, for more than 35 years, and that's how long I've known this guy in the blue hat. Um, I want you to know something before they even start, <coughs> that when I was editor of the West Seattle Herald and we were putting together a special section on the opening of the West Seattle Bridge, anybody remember the opening of the bridge in 1984? I met Paul for the first time, went over to his house, went down into his basement, and he dug through his old negatives, and there was a, an original a, a 4 by 5 negative of the first ferry boat on Puget Sound, and the negative had a little tear in it on the side, and this was going to be great for our special section on the history of transportation in West Seattle, and he just said, here, take it. He didn't know me from anybody. This is generosity in action at the first blush. 
and this is really a part of Paul's character. We've been friends ever since then, we've done things for each other, and uh, I've gotten to know Gene over the last dozen years or so as he's collaborated with Paul. These two are a special duo, and it's, it's, it's a true honor to be associated with this book. I somehow uh, was able to become its editor and to uh, write the introduction, which really sets the stage for who Paul is and what the column has been and how Gene has been involved. And you're in for a real treat tonight. Could you please give a big round of applause to Paul Dorpat and Gene Shore? Well, thank you very much, Clay. How's this microphone? Is this working? Well, okay, good. Uh, and we're delighted to be here. And I think you may be our biggest crowd out of the last 12 shows we've done. So you yourselves. So, this, um, the shows that we've done so far have always begun uh, with a little mini biography of Paul. And this one will as well. I'm, I'm the just, old one, so they give me a little deference. On that they give him deference. Paul turned 80 on October 28th of this year, which was... So, uh, how many of you have reached 80? Not very many of you. <laughs> Here. <laughs> um, he's he's seriously considering it. So some of you may get your arms bent and your cheers, cheers for Paul. Well, so each of these shows we begin with a mini bio of Paul, and we'll we'll ask you a few, a few questions if you can remember some of these significant yes. events in his life as well. So let's begin. I don't know. Do we have? Oh, interrupting us. oh yeah, Paul wants to encourage all 300 of you to interrupt us at any time and we may drag this show on till midnight but we're willing and able if you are okay so let's begin with now do we have sound attached to this video i think we do so let's we're going to start with a short video welcome Well, I found that moderately funny. <laughs> Gene, go on. Go oh, ahead. Okay, shall I go for Well, this is Paul when he was, this is, we call Paul in the war years. <laughs> it's 1943, we guess. And what are you doing here? Grand Force, North Dakota, backyard on the uh, east uh, shore of the Red River in the parsonage home of Reverend Theodore Erdman Dorpat and his five kids and wife. And that is me, the youngest child, saving America and the world for democracy <laughs> during World War II. Well, let's go back a few years, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll return to probably, mm -hmm. we're going to go back now, and we're going to see Paul, the baby of the family. <laughs> And there he is. So this must be 1939. You look like you're about nine months old here. And he's sitting on the lap of his eldest brother, Ted. Ted was a, a, a faculty member at the university and a psychoanalyst. Behind him is Norm, who is the handsome brother. And he was a, a, did the uh, employment for Washington Water Power, and then next to him is David, who became a preacher like my dad. Now, the guys in back, Norm and David, represent the conservative side of the family, and the guys in front were the more radical ones. Well, let's look at them about 15 years ago in a photo I took of Paul and his brothers. Now, we are going to get to the book pretty soon, trust me. <laughs> So that's Ted, Norm, Dave, and, and me, okay. And I think, Paul, you are the only remaining brother of this four. You being the baby. Yeah, the baby, yeah. But do you notice how handsome Norm is, the second from the left? Isn't he a good-looking guy? Really, isn't he lovely? Okay. Oh, I think he's, uh, I always admired his, uh, his aspect. 
Well, this is Paul with his father, the Reverend Theodore, and his mother, Cherry. And Paul thinks he looks more like his mother than his father. It is hard to tell. Uh, she didn't have a beard. Go ahead. Now, back in 1960, in the mid-late 60s, Paul founded and edited a, a newspaper in Seattle called The Helix. And uh, I was only 10 years old at the time, and of course I used these wonderful covers to offend my parents. And so I cut them out and post them on the walls. You mean to, ex to excite your parents? Excite them, that's right. Now, how many of you remember the Helix? Any of you? Oh, yeah. Quite a few of you. Go ahead. Kids just a little older than I will come up to Paul to this day and say, I delivered the helix on the streets of Seattle. That was a rite of passage for any 15, 16 years. They delivery, they just sold them on the end. They sold them on the end. Yeah. Well, I call that delivery. Well. And of course, the helix led to Paul's career as a promoter of rock festivals, and this is the Sky River Rock Festival. And how many people were in attendance? How many of you? Me. I was a reporter for King Television. You were a reporter for King. It was a total, absolute mud fest. It was a mud Wait a second. Okay, prove it. <laughs> Is that it? No other Sky River attendees? Wait a minute, Tina Turner was there. Tina Turner was there. Look at the list the of these people here on this. The the, yeah, Richard the Pryor was there. Right. The uh, young bloods. Oh, yeah. Santana. Why well, don't did Santana show? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and this is this is a year before Woodstock, so Paul really yeah, has to jump on. This is the first outdoor festival that's made on a farm rather than in a prepared auditorium or coliseum or something like the um, one down in california that they made a film on what was the name of that no ultima yeah no not ultima that was a that was a gravel pit so here's paul with his close friend and buddy and, th and thief tom robbins and paul is wearing a saffron robe and they are at the sky river festival together I've seen that close, buddy, about three times in the last seven years. So that's not very close to me. Good friend, though. There's Inger Ann Haig down in the roller right hand corner. Go ahead. Oh, and now we're going to validate. Yeah. Oh. There we go. I'm telling you, you guys, it was awful. It was awful. But on this day, the sun came out and the mud people. You know, in every audience we've asked, are you in this photo? And no one has admitted it so far. I had a camera, so you guys. You have a camera, okay. okay. You, were being, you were being tested. Okay. So the next decade, Paul became uh, the Paul we know today, and, he, and his first publication in this effort was 294 Glimpses of Historic Seattle, which he sold for 294 cents. But that was for the mayor's small business task force. Uh, typically, I made no money on anything. I don't know how I survived. Do you know how I survived? I do. It was through the kindness of strangers. Uh, <laughs> so 294 glimpses, of which I think Paul claims 40,000 copies were sold. That's the truth, because you had to count the copies when you ordered them from the printer. And we did it four times, 10,000 runs. Within a few months, Paul's column at the Times began, which was started in January 17th, 1982. Yeah. And here he is with a Seattle uh, legend. And, and does anyone know who this is? Murray Morgan. It's Murray Morgan. You're taking too much time in the studio. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. What are you, a reporter? Or what is yeah. yeah. <laughs> He lived behind my grandparents in Tacoma. Oh, but the lake? No, in town when he was a kid. Oh, but go really? On. Oh, what a wonderful family. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, he was a Unitarian minister. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and here's Paul with Lucy Campbell Coe. Uh, Anybody know Lucy Campbell yes. Coe? Um, yes. You did there. <laughs> Would you mind giving her a chair? Come on. Oh, 
trying to sit up here with us? <laughs> Everything Paul says is true. Well, not I know. <laughs> Lucy Campbell Coe was actually a, a witness to the Seattle fire. She was a small child when looking down from the hill as the fire raged across 30 blocks. Of He's trying to distinguish her from being a large child. No, I was a large child, Paul. That's right, you were. So you do carry that I do carry that. It's a little, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's a little wound that I carry. Right. I was four and they thought I was seven and then yeah. they thought I was a little disadvantaged because well, little, did they know. little did they know. Well, we jump forward now to 2011 when Paul and I and our friend Berenger Lamont did a show at Mohai uh, of uh, statewide now and then, combined with city now and then. And Berenger, our, our Parisian friend, did a, um, a Parisian foyer in which she walked around Paris and repeated some very famous photos of Paris. So she took this photo of us standing in front of the Mohai exhibit also uh, not so famous photos the ones that i shot and there were some ones there were some that 56, Paul shot 56. when he was 16 years old visiting paris uh as a kid yeah for free here we are together in 2011 as a result of coming out and berger came over uh, to join us for that program. And now I'm going to flip back to the first time we, we went to Paris to meet Berenger, and there's a little event that occurred, and we don't have sound, so you'll just have to imagine a well, little narrative. Right here, don't you? We don't have sound, is what I'm saying. We're <laughs> going to go to a video of Paul and a very interesting thing that happened and, and uh, while we were in Paris. And here we go. Oh, that's he looks very much like me, doesn't he? He does. Put the glasses. Put the glasses. <laughs> take, them, take this video. Okay. So watch closely now as Paul sits down at a table with a man. He looks exactly like him. I've never seen anything like this in all my life. So our friend Baron Jair said, "Don't no, go back. We need to. I need to get a picture of this. This is incredible." So Paul returned, sat down at the table, and we have a moment when the two of them look up into the camera that I'm holding, and I have to note that. I was laughing so hard the camera begins to shake. <laughs> and here they're about to look at the two of them with the identical expression. <laughs> All right, can we pause for a while? Yes. Those of you who think that was worth it, this is for our future shows. Please raise your hands and say it was okay to show that. For those of you who were offended by it, raise your hands now. So we got a good vote. How about you? Was it okay? I just can't believe it. Yeah, okay. Isn't that amazing? I, we're still kind of stunned. Well, Berger went back several years later and tracked this guy down. And it turns out he's a Romanian Orthodox priest. And she took a picture of him in his church where he just won an award for restoration of his Orthodox church in Paris. But Paul, we, we now say Paul has a doppelganger. Well, now let's get started on the book here. This is... This is a selection of about a, a hundred subjects that we, we took from Paul's 1,800 plus columns over 37 years. It will be 37 years this January. He started January 17th, uh, 1982, and we're going to go to the very first photo that appeared in his very first column, and here it is. Now this, Anybody want to tell us where this is? It is Westlake. You got it. 
Today is Wednesday, March 12, 1919, and this is a celebration of a parade celebrating the homecoming of Seattle's own regiment, the 63rd Coast Artillery. And they've come back from the First World War. A huge parade of local heroes and uh, through downtown has just ended, and uniformed men and celebrating citizens are mingling on the streets. And my job as today, the photographer now, is to go back to this location and find a comparable event. And the one that I came up with about a year and a half ago now was January 21st, 2017. And here it is. It's the largest march in Seattle history. Uh, also, How many of you were there? Quite a few. What was in a march for? Women's march. This was the Women's March, the day after the inauguration. So I thought, well, this is a significant moment in our history. And as it turned out, and I didn't know it at the time, it actually has been counted as the, as the largest group of people to mass on the streets. And, and here's the original photo that Paul took in the fall of 82 with a lovely barista on the right-hand side holding the photograph. And I think you were only, what, 42 years old yourself? 45 at the time? 45, you were 45. No, I, I think you were, 82, yeah. A young um, man. 42 sounds about right. Yeah. And here's the column in the book. And, it's, and the book is organized chronologically, so the first column is uh, Paul's first column, and it is also the first column sequentially. In it's the, book. the chronology of how I produced it. It's not the chronology of the content. Yeah, connected to the column itself. We jump to Seattle's deepest snow. This is in 1880 on January 4th. On January 5th, the snow began to fall, and it kept on falling. And in eight days, 64 inches of snow fell. And here we are looking up at first and cherry. Uh, you say, I don't see 64 inches. And you're, of course, you're true. You don't see 64. But you see, the sun's out. And so the storm's over, and now things are starting to, to melt. That's uh, Yesler's pavilion there on the right that the southeast corner of Cherry and First, which was then called Front, it was the most popular place to hold a meeting or a dance or anything. Henry Esler, one of the pioneers. And behind him is the, the, the sheriff's home. And behind that is the, the Baptist Church, what First year? Baptist, 1880. And who can tell us the date of our second deepest snow? 1916, when St. James Cathedral's dome collapsed. And it's in the book. <laughs> it's in the book, but not in this show. Well, again, I tried to repeat this photo, and, and uh, about a year and a half ago, I returned for the last snowfall. And you can see there's a little bit of snow in the picture. And there's this, actually something that's piled high on the fire hydrant, at least six inches. Oh, well, that's an interesting. I would say exaggerated. Do you think I'm exaggerating? Yes, it's about three inches. Okay. Now let's turn to the waterfront with the great Norwegian photographer who came to Seattle for less than a decade, Anders Vilsa, and took a number of marvelous and uh, lovely photos. Here's his photo of the waterfront in the late. 1890s? Uh, from the foot of Union Street. And I returned there last year and took a shot of the same location. Uh, who are those kids, Gene? Oh, those are my drama students from Hillside Student Community. And look, at, I love Will Maltz, who's leaping in the foreground with joy. What was the last role he played in one of your plays? Uh, I think he played bottom. Here's another wonderful Anders Vilsa photo taken of 
the waterfront a little bit further south with his back to Columbia. He's uh, shooting up Railroad Avenue and recording a gold rush scene. And if you look closely, you can see a sign hanging off the store that says aluminum houses for sale, only 150 pounds. And so for men traveling up to the Yukon, they could divide up an aluminum house and carry it on their backs up the Today, there we are at Coleman Dock with its iconic subway. <laughs> I used iconic just for you. Yeah, I was a little offended by that, but uh, yeah, I let it pass. Anders also returned to Norway at the urgings of his wife, who, who uh, insisted, and uh, became the uh, Nor Norway's national treasure. And for the next 35 years or so, he shot pictures all over Norway, and in fact, they recently released a series of stamps with his photos on them. And here's one of them. Now we're up on top of Smith Tower, and this is in February 1913, when the last rivets were punctured into its skeleton. The Smith Tower was finally topped off, and now with 42 stories attached to the horizon, everyone could imagine a trip to the top, but only Webster and Stevens photographer Frank Knoll got up there before it was finished and shot this picture looking to the north. And it was the first uh, view from that location which enabled a, 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 a viewer to look at Queen Anne and Lake Union and Wallingford where Paul lives. Uh, here's an example of uh, that Gene just did something. He said it was the only one to do that. And that's because he's a storyteller and a very good one and a good theater guy. Almost surely there were more people to do that than just know. Okay, Gene? Except that tower didn't open for another year, so Frank Knoll was People pretty were early. Up there. Did you think they were sneaking up? I could show them to you, Gene. I think you snuck up there a couple times. I have photos. Well, I'm not going to talk about them, but... Paul, I oh, want no, to no, no, don't talk about okay, that. Okay, we'll go for it. I want you now to keep your eyes in the middle of the photograph here, and I'm going to walk around and point. Because it's handy to do so. I'm going to show you. There, of course, is the Rainier Club and the Methodists behind it. Let's just take a look. Uh, let's go to each of these screens. Take a look at the Rainier Club here. <laughs> There and the Methodists behind you can see Lake Union and Queen Anne and Wallingford up in the distance. But keep your eyes focused on the Rainier Club as we go to the next slide. And I want you to watch this transformation. Here we go. Rainier Club. Yeah. And their own both churches. Yeah. That's the Methodist church. And Methodist Church here, and of course there's St. James above the hill. Well, watch now, and you will see a couple of things reappear. And let's see what we've lost as we look at it from this year. Okay. So there's the Rainier Club. You can see just the edge of of the Methodist Church. You can see, still see St. James. But where's Lake Union? Let's take a look. Let's repeat. There we go. And Plymouth in that first one? Plymouth Church. Oh, in the first one. The Arctic one. Let's see. Well, Plymouth wasn't the, the original Plymouth. Where was that, Paul? Third Avenue. Second Avenue. No, no. Third Avenue. It was on. Oh, no. Sixth. 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 So this All right, is fourth. Wait a second. We have a disagreement. This what? is third. Does somebody want to give us but Plymouth? The Methodist Church is fifth. This is fifth. Here. It's on 6th now. Sixth yes, it is on 6th, but now. where it was yeah, first down. was down on 3rd Avenue. Uh, let me see, Madison. Madison, I think, right around, uh, I think, uh, the, the, the north of uh, Madison, two blocks. So we have Spring and Seneca. Yeah, that's it. That's where it was. I'm yes. pretty confident of that. It was on. 
Now we jump up to a little bit north. We're up, headed up towards the Ship Canal, and here's the Monongahela escaping Lake Union after several years in birth there. And the Monongahela, after this escape, this is in on March 25th, 1931, and Monongahela, uh, the Monongahela uh, was sold to a logging company in Vancouver, BC, where it survived a few years hauling logs before being scrapped. And let's look at it today, and we'll complete the Aurora Bridge. And there we are. I'd like to make a point here, if I may, Jean. Yeah. One of the real values of this book, which Gene is primarily responsible for putting together, because the biggest chore was not writing the columns. Those were all done. They had to be edited, and and uh, of course you got help from that, uh, from Clay and and a couple of others. Uh, but the big effort here was to go out and reshoot the now shots. So this gave him the opportunity in choosing the hundred or so articles out of the 1800 that I had written to choose articles that would be fun and revealing for him to go out and reshoot. So now what you've got in this book, which I'm sure you're going to buy several copies for your relatives in the Midwest, <laughs> is that this book really is a great presentation of the contemporary Seattle. It's just not the history of the Seattle. It's just a great display of Seattle today. And so look at it from that point of view too, please, okay? All right, so we're going to jump up to the top of the bridge, but before we go there... We're not going to jump off. So we're not jumping off. We're jumping up, and we're going to first pause at the Taft Key. In 1909, William Howard Taft was given this key by a uh, for to signal the opening of the 1909 Yukon Alaska Pacific Exposition in Seattle. The key was presented by George Carmack, the man who first discovered gold in the Yukon territories. The key was made of solid gold and was adorned with 22 solid gold nuggets that were found by Mr. Carmack. And so. It became known as the Taft Key. It was used to open uh, the AYP, but it was also used for the following opening. AYP was in 1909, right? The Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Well, yeah. here we are in 1932. It's the, it's the George Washington Memorial Bridge, uh, which we know as the Aurora Bridge, uh, commonly, and before this crowd flowed out from both sides, this crowd of thousands, it was February 22nd, 1932, and before they rushed out onto the bridge, a, uh, an opponent of this bridge, who was the governor, Roland Hartley, and had spent much of his uh, career in vain against highway projects, and certainly this bridge project, he was taking credit and, and pontificating and bloviating and, and while well, the crowd listened. Well, he went on for s at such length that he wasn't, he paid no attention to the time, not knowing that uh, the time was rapidly approaching, which was 2.57, that Herbert Hoover was waiting in D.C. with his finger poised on the Taft key. And he, before Hartley finished his long speech, taking credit for this bridge, which he'd long opposed. Hoover pressed the Taft key, the flags unfurled, the, the, the crowds poured out onto the bridge, the fireboats shot off their plumes, and uh, Hartley never finished his speech. <laughs> Don't you like that? <laughs> yeah. What's that? I think he was defeated in the primary. I think he the next one. lost the election. Next yeah. one, yeah. He was a bit of a scoundrel, but of course he was from Everett, so... <laughs> no, 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 that's a joke. We, we personally love Everett, and we want to encourage anybody here from Everett to think about buying a book on Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in an approximate location. Now let's go forward a little bit because we're going to look at another character, the last use of the Taft key before it went into the Smithsonian. Well, this is, I'm sorry, this is Herbert Hoover. This is 32 when Hoover, when Hoover set the interrupted Roland Hartley. But let's look at it 
Let's jump forward once more and check out the final use, which was 1962. There it is. And here's what he was opening. This is a page directly from the book. It is a photo you can see on the left of young Paula Dahl, who was acclaimed as the nine millionth visitor to the fair. Century 21, right? Century 21. You can see in the old photo, you can see the dog she was given. You can see her parents beaming on the far left. And behind her, you can see her sister glowering. <laughs> And in the modern photo taken a few years ago, you can see Paula, now Paula Jones, standing with her group of elementary school students in Issaquah, and on the wall of her classrooms, she proudly mounts the nine millionth visitor sign. <laughs> oh, she's holding it there in the picture. Yeah, she takes it down from the wall for this, for this photo. All right. What's this, you guys? Which fire? 1889. Which one? Great fire. That's right, the Great Fire, 1889. Yeah. Now, why don't you think there were many photos taken of the fire as it was burning? Why is this one of the few, Paul? Well, let's ask our audience whether they can just use common sense to come to some conclusion that will satisfy us all. Why are there so few pictures of the fire itself? Very few campers. That's one good reason. Number two, they're trying to save the cameras they had to some extent and their dark rooms. It came at a moment when they didn't know it was coming. So there was a variety of reasons why there's so few actual pictures of fire. There may be about a dozen in all. Let's go forward. We're looking now at first and spring. So let's look at it today. And by the way, all of these buildings in the historical photograph were burned and disappeared, including Fry Opera House, the tallest structure in the center. And today, first and spring, when I can't get to the same location exactly, but I need to get up high, I have a 20 foot long extension pole and so I mount my camera on top of that and, and focus it down the street and shoot a lot of photos trying to get the right one. He does. And we all respect Gene for the labors he takes with what we call his big 22-footer. Thank you, David. Oh, you're welcome. Well, here we come to uh, the aftermath of the fire. This is only a couple days later. And uh, we see the fire crew standing below, and you might recognize this location. We'll go there today and then flip back. Here Seattle we go. Hotel. You got oh, it. Wow. Who, did, who said that? Yeah. Our usual you, interlocutor. Our usual uh, <laughs> our know it all. Our only man. Our know it all. Relatives. <laughs> so, Seattle Hotel is very significant. We'll get to that significance in the next minute or so. But, of course, it was replaced. You can see back there by the lovely sinking ship garage. The front, the prow of the sinking ship garage is, we can look back in this old photo, that's basically where the prow of it is today. And that, of course, was the entrance uh, to a bank and above it the windows of the Occidental Hotel, which was there before the Seattle Hotel, and then it was rebuilt. Let's look at it. There's Sinking Ship Garage. You're going to correct me now, Paul? Uh, no, I'm going to ask how many people here are involved, perhaps, in the attempt to save the Seattle Hotel. How many, any of you involved in one? Lovers of Seattle Hotel. Uh, two. Lost well, let's look at it. Here's the Seattle Hotel in 1908. What a beauty, festooned with flags and, and, and in, a, in a lovely celebration downtown in Pioneer Square. And this is what we've replaced it with. So watch closely as we go. Not the Smith Tower, of course, which was several years later, but there's the sinking ship garage. And the sinking ship garage after the fire. 
The Samo Hotel was built right after. Are you the asking fire. about the sinking ship garage or yes. what? Yeah, after the fire. The, the, the fire was sinking ship garage is the sixties. No, I beg your pardon. I'm really confused. After they destroyed a lot of the old buildings for uh, World Fair time when they were trying to improve the environment, modernize it, and that included destroying uh, the hotel, the Seattle Hotel, right? Well, there's another view of the Seattle Hotel we're going to take a look at, and Paul will explain the actual, uh, and perhaps unknown to you, sensitivity of the creators of the sinking ship sinking garage. Ship garage. Let's say that together, Gene. Sinking, sinking ship, ship garage. Okay, I'm going to be his his hands, and I will show you as he describes. Well, they, he, a lot of people objected to that, and I was wondering if there's some people here or, or around right then, because they say it's, it's really uh, the... The uh, Pioneer Square neighborhood is famous for its, you know, its, its architecture, which was so still famous for it. But they said, well, it's all right. We're going to be the, the producers of the garage, they, the builders of it. They said, we're going to be sensitive to those things you're sensitive to, and we're going to repeat the, the, back, the basket uh, arches, the, the basket handle arches on the uh, on the piping that goes around the top of the garage which they did so that's a that's sensitivity that's sensitivity. <laughs> so we might mourn the loss of that glorious hotel well there was one other thing that many of you know uh, that uh, the loss of the Seattle Hotel inspired and that was Art. Victor Steinbrook oh, yeah. who fought the destruction of the hotel, but it, it launched, the, the, the sinking ship launched a thousand ships. Yeah. And they all culminated and saved the market. Yeah. And fishing ships. And some fishing ships, too. <laughs> well, let's go forward, and we're going to take a look at the market in 1907 and what it is today. So, of course, Victor Steinbrook was, uh, was, one of the, was one of the movers and shakers, and I think we have someone here tonight who, who uh, helped Victor and, and, uh, and uh, supplied him with, with uh, some of the legal framework to, to get this thing started against the, the yeah, against Wes Ullman. Oh, I did. I did the TV. Yeah. Yeah. You got it right. You got it right. Is he here? Yeah. He just was telling us this. Well, well, we'll get. Well, he'll he'll leave. Leave. He's usually working the lights for this event. Okay. So he'd be in the back of the room. Well, let's go forward. We're going to look at the market today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell him I'm really offended that he left like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's right back there. Oh, he's right back there. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Working the lights. Singer, where are you? Singler, I mean. Where are you? There he is. Another savior of the market. Very good. Okay. He drafted the ordinance that, uh, for Victor. <laughs> All right. Now, if you've been a loyal reader of Paul's column, you may know oh. where this is because this was featured only a couple years ago in the column. It was taken in the mid-50s, 1950s, by a Boeing engineer who carried his camera around, whose name was Werner Lingenhager. And he was commemorating, or I guess he was memorializing something that would soon disappear. Let's take a look at what replaced this. <laughs> That's Melrose Place originally, that, that little ditch, uh, that little alleyway, Melrose Place. Melrose is right above it, above the concrete, uh, you know, the side of the freeway to the east now. Now here's another story of, um, of loss and, and some would say victory. This is the the old uh, post office down at 3rd and Union. And if you were a citizen of the Times, you would say, meet me at the steps. And other citizens would know you meant the steps of the post office, which were made of sandstone. 
Chuckanut sandstone. Say that together, Chuckanut sandstone. Now what was the quality of the Chuckanut sandstone? It must have been good. Well, it wasn't. It was porous. And in fact, the first Chuckanut sandstone they brought down for, the, for this uh, federal post office, they had to refuse. And it was used instead in the Satellite Candies Company building, which was uh, on Columbia and Western. You remember that? Well, anyway, that's where it wound up. Go ahead. Now, it had another quality, is that it stained easily. And what, is the, what traditionally is the little critter that likes to hang around public places? Pigeons. Pigeons, yeah. Pigeon poop was really the contribution they made. Gene? Yeah, indeed. And so the, these chuckanut sandstone steps, after 60 years or so, were so covered with pigeon poop that by the late 50s, they began tearing it down and replacing it with something far more impervious to pigeon poop. I don't know, well, let's just take a look at today's lovely post office. Uh, okay, this, looks, this looks considerably better than the one they built right after they tore it down. They, they made a new front to it. They did make a new front to it. Yeah. All right. Did any of you live here? <laughs> None of you? Are there any childhood residents of Hooverville? Uh, okay. Well, this is about 250 of 500 houses down at the docks. And they let me come back and repeat this photo. The B.F. Goodrich building was there for the original photo. And I went back and they let me climb up on a hoist where I shot. Watch Smith Tower now. Eyes on Smith Tower. There we are today. And only a few miles down the coast, and this is another sad story, are we have several thousand books being held by US Customs, and only nine of them here tonight. Yes, we are in the middle of a trade war with China. And so the books that should have arrived in October are arrived about 10 days ago, and U.S. Customs has been holding on to them with all their grasp. We don't know why, but we hope to get them in the next day or so. Gene and Clay, what, what will these good citizens do in the face of this shortage? We have some when solutions. They're clamoring for the books. <laughs> the books. Well, one thing to reassure everybody here is that yes, we are going to sell these books tonight, and Paul and Jean can inscribe them for you however you wish, but the same thing can happen if you order them online at Paul's website called pauldorpat.com. There is a space there for you to indicate how to have them inscribed, and we have every reason to believe that we will be able to be mailing these out in another week or two at the latest, well in time for gift giving to uh, all of the relatives in the Midwest, right Paul? <laughs> yes, and at the same price. We don't we don't charge you more while we're delaying you. Know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the well, same let's, price. After that commercial interruption, <laughs> let's now jump forward to Fremont. And this is a uh, one of the last trolley cars to patrol Fremont, and I have to actually have to correct myself. It's a streetcar, and of course my mother remembered this. That in the early 40s, all these streetcars, most of them were replaced by gasoline engine buses and uh, overhead trackless, trackless trolleys. And so this is one of the. This was taken by one of the one of the streetcar operators uh, in Fremont, and you can see the Fremont Baptist Church hovering up above at the very tip top there. Well, I had to go back and find a photo that was as significant as a streetcar, the disappearance of the streetcars, and so I went back last year to the same location, and I I, I think I found something that might be. <laughs> Okay. 
Now, Paul has always been a, you know, after his Sky River days, he's always been a bit of a prude. So this... It's hard to take. It's harder for him to take this, this photo, but I forced it upon him. Is that in the book, too? That is in the book. Yes. yes. Uh, we we uh, especially recommend you buy more than one copy. <laughs> sure. and think, think of your friends in Peoria, Illinois. That's right. And in front, we, of course, have, in place of the trolley, two women walking abreast. <laughs> adding surprises you know? <laughs> like. so here we are in Chinatown in the early 20s the Go Hing Festival and uh, the International District has, has changed very little just up the street there is the Wing Luke Museum today and to repeat this photo with lion dancers and happy celebrants in the foreground near the Hotel Milwaukee I went to the same spot a couple doors down, knocked on the door, and found the Seattle Kung Fu Club, where they happily trooped out on the street with their... Oh, oh. Yeah. Let's take a look. Yeah. And right in the middle of them, behind the three kids, is Sifu Zhang Liang, who's been teaching there since 1960 and is 80 years old. And he was one of Bruce Lee's teachers. So he's been there a while. And there's the Hotel Milwaukee, yeah, there up to the left there. The guy, uh, one of the, I was worried about having people take over King Street for 10 minutes, but um, one, of the, one of his uh, uh, acolytes is a West Seattle cop, so he said. <laughs> Where are we here, you guys? Um, it looks like they're well, it it's could got, be Lake Washington. It's got some of Lake Washington water in it. Or it could. Yeah, it probably does. It does, actually. Is it the Mississippi? No. no. It's, a, it's a river. It's called a river. It is a river. It's a river. Which river is it? We're going to give you a little clue. It's not white. Here Black. it is. Black. Black River. Exactly. Yeah. There it is. That's the clue. We, okay. Looks like we faded to blue, though. Not the black. No, 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 it's not the Blue River. It is the Black River. And here it is today. The reason the Black River has disappeared today is because, of course, Lake Washington was lowered by nine feet. And so the Black River now only rises through culverts and occasionally in a little Tuck Willow Park. But you can't boat along it anymore. And it was once the channel that led from Lake Washington out to the Sound. Uh, where the ship canal is? No. South. No. The southern end. The southern, southern, uh, so here we are at Rainier in near Renton. Good question. Good question. We should take care of that so you're not confused. We should... We should thank you. Yeah. You see to it. We will. We're going to run up north. These are the children who sold 20,000 books for Paul in the 80s. <laughs> They're very, very good to me, these kids. They're the brown kids. And the papa was a, a clarinet player with uh, oh. the most famous band in Seattle in the, at those times. It was Doc. What's the name of it? Vic Myers? Vic Myers. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm getting old. Did you know this happen to you at all when you get old? Sometimes you kind of forget a word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Suddenly. What? No, it wasn't Blackwell. Oh, it's a good one because there was a Blackwell around here. Right? Wagner. Pop Wagner. Pop Wagner. Pop Wagner. Yeah. The most famous you know, concert band and marching band. Yeah. So the guy that was a parent of these. Of these kids was in that band as a clarinetist. And didn't the boy become a Seattle cop? He did. Yeah. He has that distinctive glare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And here we are today with my neighbor's children, Tia and Liana Owen, standing in, the, in approximately the same location. This is uh, looking across what was once Lake Union at near Westlake and Aloha. 
and they are now in a, in a city parking lot. I took that in 2011 for the Mohai show, and I thought, well, it would be fun to bring them back, and we can see them then and now. So let's look at them this year. There they are. Tia's driving now, which is terrifying. She's driving. <laughs> which one is Tia? I forget. She's on the left. Yeah. How old is she? She's 16. We jumped with the Kalakala coming through the locks. How many of you have ridden on the Kalakala? Raise your hands. Oh, now we can do it I think this is the. How many of you have not ridden on the Kalakala? Raise your hands. So it's pretty much it's pretty even, but this is certainly the largest crowd of Kalakala riders we have ever encountered. <laughs> And I have to tell all of you, though, my mother, when she was 16, lost her tooth on the Kalakala. 16? It went down the drain. She had knocked it out earlier, and it was one of those dental, you know, bridges. And she she was so ashamed. She was at a church camp, and, and she was coming back from where, you know, Bainbridge or wherever it was, and she, and she uh, felt the tooth loosening, and she tried to fix it, and it went down the drain of the clock. Now we're going to have to do another vote. Those of you who are in favor of his mother's tooth story <laughs> being included in future lectures, please raise your hand. There's only ten of you, so we'll cut it out for the future. Oh, I think it was pretty even, wasn't it? No, we lost it. We oh, lost a big yeah. part of the audience with my mother's tooth. Well, I, you should use the fact that part of her loss of the tooth was the famous quality, and you know what this is, of the of the uh, of the clock. Well, what is that quality? The running quality of it. Well, the, it vibrated. It, was, it shook. It vibrated. It was the noisiest. It was like a single stroke engine. Couldn't you just change the story a little bit? <laughs> that the, it was the Kalakala that extracted her to? Yeah. <laughs> sort of shook it from her face. That would be wild. Well, I don't know. I mean, you're an honest man. More honest than I. Well, I had to go back once again and find a, a photo uh, that in some ways matched the significance of this one. And mine was a surprise to me because I only discovered its significance a few months ago. Here we go. Same spot. This is the USS Turner Joy. And I only found out a couple months ago the Turner Joy, and I took this photo in 2017, I only found out that the Turner Joy, which is here seen coming back to its Bremerton port uh, berth from being uh, restored in Lake Union, that the Turner Joy was one of the two ships in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964. So. Uh, significant moment in American history represented here and unknowingly captured by me and so I found another photo of the Turner Joy actually in the Gulf of Tonkin. Who would like to explain to us from the audience the significance of the Gulf of Tonkin? Huh? We don't have time for it? We're almost over. Oh I see it's so long. It's a long story. Go ahead sir. So I'm a high school history teacher, and the version that we tell is that it is the incident that was used by uh, Johnson to trump up the war and escalate it into what it became. Very good. That's exactly Very good. So. Very succinct and I think accurate too. Really. It is. It is succinct and accurate, and it, it happened on August 2nd and 4th in 1964. If it happened at all. It well, the August 2nd did happen. The 4th did not. The fourth was the made-up incident on which Johnson... So there was a little skirmish on August 2nd, and the fourth was constructed Throwing by probably the whole cloth. Yeah. All right, let's go right. forward. Clay went back to Salty's in West Seattle, and he shot the wheelhouse of the Kalakala, which is not much remains, but we look at the wheelhouse, and then he went inside and shot a lovely picture. Thank you, Clay. <laughs> kind of haunting. The Kalakala. On the day that uh, this was to be Tevin's final trashing, uh, Jerry Kingan, the owner of Salty's on Alki, and who created the Red Robin restaurants, and he went down there and bought a few pieces of the Kalakala, and then had them trucked up to his restaurant, and you can go there any time of the day or night and see what's left. Uh, what, what's the best thing to order there, though, Clay? 
<laughs> a hamburger. Oh, okay. A martini. Best, best thing to order is the Alaskan Way Viaduct. Ooh. Ooh. Nice shift. And here we are in April, just before it opened, with two, two women uh, dressed in red in 1953. And it was taken by one of our favorite unknown photographers, Horace Sykes. Well, it's, what do you mean he's unknown? Well, I don't know him. Did you know him? No, but that's... Does anyone here know Horace Sykes? <laughs> that's what I mean by unknown. No, it's not like saying Ansel Adams or Ashel Curtis. And it's Horace Sykes, who was a magnificent photographer, but unknown because he's been forgotten, except by us. And those two women. And those two women. Wait a second. I'm going to ask you, do any of you ever look at the blog we do every weekend? that goes with the article? Yes. All right, that, on that blog, for over a year, we ran our daily Sykes. Now, if you looked at any time during that year, if you looked at that blog, you saw a whole bunch of Sykes photographs. He was not unknown to you. You may have forgotten him since then, <laughs> but he was not unknown. And so I defend his uh, ubiquity, and uh, even though it passed from you. Thank you. All right. Well, he was a marvelous photographer, even if unknown. <laughs> let's look at his, let's go back last year and we're going to take a look at this same scene, which is about to disappear forever from our consciousness. And for those of you who know West Seattle, I'm, I apologize. But here it is from 2017. That's what we're going to lose. It's one of those views that, that many sentimentalists love. I'm now going to point out a little building here, a big building, this one right here, which is, was originally called the Mark, and is now the F5 building. And you can see it right there next to Columbia Tower. Well, it was just being completed in the spring of 2017, and this was, this is another little uh, tidbit of information that we discovered only recently, which was that the original developer who commissioned this building uh, was a huge fan of Audrey Hepburn. And he particularly loved Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. And there's a photo from Breakfast at Tiffany's, and he asked the architectural firm to design him a building that contained the essence of Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. I'm serious. So let's look at the photo that was in the lobby as they were constructing the building for the several years they were bringing this thing to, into, into prominence. Here it is. Look at Audrey. Now, you can look at her shoes and her hips and her cigarette holder. And now look at the building again. Did you see it? And I just found that a, a kind of a delightful tidbit of... Thank you for sharing it. Oh, thank you. Well, and interestingly, Paul and I both enjoy Audrey Hepburn and the F5 building. We, we like it. Yeah. How about you guys? Do you like that building? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wasn't that... Is that Kevin Daniels? Who? Kevin Daniels. Yes, it was. You already know way more than Who we know. Who was the chair so of historic explain. Seattle? Yes, it's saved a lot of good buildings. It's, it's Kevin well. Daniels. Daniels and the architects were ZGF. You bet. And uh, he was the one who wanted, uh, insisted on the Audrey Hepburn qualities in the structure that he that he wanted to. Are make. you living here now? What? Are you living here? Do I live here? Of course I live here. Who are you Paul? Oh, I, didn't know. I didn't know you lived here. Yeah. <laughs> Three years. Oh, wow. Yeah. The existing Daniels you all get old. Like no, no relation. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so we're going to run up north now, and we're looking at an Ashel Curtis photograph of Green Lake, taken looking to the west. And to repeat this photo, I had to go back a number of times because it was so... Uh, well, let's just take a look here. You can see the transition from about 1903 to this about eight months ago. And it's a big shift. You really can't see the lake anymore. I, I managed to get a crow in there. 
and a bicyclist and a bus and the mountains up at the very that's the only remaining feature that that's reflected from the original we'll go back watch the mountains they're hiding behind structures now but we're pretty close Very good, Gene. Very good. Let's give Gene a hand on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we're almost over. Our we are. We're, we're, we've got only a couple more slides here, and this is now we're coming into um, a photo that was that was uh, loaned to Paul by um, a Seattle personage, and it is a picture of the oldest structure still standing, Clay, in Seattle. Right. Here it is. Tell us about who gave you this picture, Paul. And Iger Hagland. Oh. He was his mother was raised in this building. His parents moved onto this uh, Elky Point uh, lot in '69, the year she was born, 1869, and she was raised there. And uh, his mom is wearing the white dress, and her mother yeah. in black beside him. And the father is the black coat, Hans Nelson, who played a Norwegian. The family was very musical. I mean, a very musical family. All of them played instruments. Didn't the father play the Hardinger? The Hardinger? Hardinger. I don't know what that is. That's the Norwegian violin. Oh, see, I didn't know that. You're being really kind of esoteric with me. <laughs> I don't know. I allow you that. I can't you. say it's so okay. Off to the right, we have Snidely Whiplash. Sort of looks like him. Sitting right there. The I thing about this building is that what's peculiar about this building? Did you um, mention it already? I haven't yet. Ivor is not born yet. How, do you, how did Ivor pronounce his name? How did Ivor's friend pronounce his name? Evar. 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 That's right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what is unique about this building, Gene? Well, we I, I started with its unique quality, which is it's the oldest structure in Seattle, and it was built for and by Doc Maynard to replace the building that that uh, when he moved to West Seattle in '57 to get away from Pioneer Square. Uh, he uh, he took about more than 300 acres in West Seattle and started a farm and nearly starved to death with his wife Catherine. But they they this was the house that replaced the first house that he was living there, and it still remains uh, about a block away from this location. It was moved from the beach all up to up on 64th, and it is un heralded and unmarked, except there's a little plaque at the end of the street saying, here stood a house once. But this is the, this is the house that was there, uh, and here it is today. It has lost its right-hand wing, and, but you can see members of uh, the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, of, of which Clay was the director, and there's Clay standing on the Where is far Clay? left. On the far left, okay. Yeah. He looks a little thinner there than he does now. <laughs> well, he had a very good meal here tonight. And there's the plaque that sits at the end of the street. And that's about it. But okay, if you, you guys, is that the show? No, we got another. We're going to now pause and finish up with Princess Angeline, who was named that by... Catherine Maynard, Doc Maynard's second wife. And she lived uh, below Western, below what is now the market. And it was not precisely known where she lived below Western until Paul and uh, Ron Edge uh, uh, triangulated a number of photos and found a, a pretty close approximation of where her shack was. Now you'll find this photograph cut in half and uh, hand painted and like in many collections. And the left half is what interested the marketers. But it's the right half with all those trees and other structures 
and and posts that go along Western Avenue that really revealed where this picture was taken. So that was very important in figuring out where this was exactly. We know it was near Pike, but here, with uh, especially Ron doing most of the work, a, a retired uh, engineer, uh, pretty much pegged it. And Gene put Ron in the repeat photo. So we went back and what was kind of delightful to me was that we discovered, I was worried that we'd be in a parking garage or a basement, and in fact, we were in the open air in a little slot between the Pike Place parking garage and the Fix Medor building. And Ron is sitting about on the porch, he estimates, where, now this is only a, a year ago that, that we did this, and uh, that we took this photo and put, put it in the paper. And so there's been no time to put up a plaque, but this is the spot where uh, Princess Angeline lived. And if you want to see it, a good way to do it is to go down to the market and go have a meal at Lowell's, go up to the second floor and look out the window, and it's right below you. So Princess Angeline's actual name was Kiki Soblu. She was uh, the, the daughter of Chief Seattle. Yes. And we have an inset of, of Chief Seattle with Kiki Soblu or Princess Angeline sitting in what is now the Pike Place Market. And we, we managed to, to uh, uh, find a couple of, uh, through Clay's help actually, we managed to find two descendants of both Kiki Soblu and Chief Seattle. And I'm going to show you the photo here in which both of them are sitting in about the same location that Kiki Soblu sat next to the market. The, the woman on the left is the great, 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 great granddaughter of Kiki Soblu, Mary Lou Slaughter, who is a magnificent and accomplished basket weaver and cedar worker and made the vests that they're wearing. On to her right is, uh, to our right, is Ken Workman, the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle's second uh, wife. Actually, neither of them were actually available this day, so we rented a couple of replacements from Hollywood Central <laughs> and, uh, Aren't they beautiful? Now take a look, good look at Mary Lou, and I hate to tell you this, but she's 80 years old. She is 80 Why do you years hate old. To tell us that? Because it makes us all feel so, so bad. It oh, makes me feel bad. <laughs> she looks younger than I do, and I'm 61. Let's look at her. What's that? Photoshopping. No, not at all. Gene never does photoshopping. He's completely authentic. And when you buy your three copies, <laughs> uh, four or five copies now, I think, when you buy those, you'll know that you have that honorable pledge that he didn't Photoshop a damn thing in those things. Is that true, Gene? No, that is true. Now, as we are in uh, the market, and I'm, we're, I was taking this picture, and Clay was standing behind me with his own camera, and he took a picture of me taking a picture. <laughs> and they're, they're wearing cedar hats that Mary Lou created. And uh, the, there was a fun little moment after we took these photos. And, and as I was taking this photo, Clay and I and another couple of folks were standing around watching. And we saw Ken jerk around a couple times and, and uh, look behind him. And we stopped down at Ivar's after, after the photo shoot. And I said, Ken, well, why were you turning around? Why were you jerking around? He said, oh, I, for a moment I thought someone was picking my pocket. And I said, really? We didn't see anybody behind you. And he said, no, but someone was tapping me on the arm. Wow. And Paul, you know, Paul and I have, we, we've come to blows over this, but because I think that I will call that the nudge of history. <laughs> so he's allowed his poetics, and he does that in sacrificing his truth. 
But that's all right. There are different kinds of truths. There's jocular truth, there's practical truth, there's very similar to truth. This is not very similar to truth, however. This is jocular truth. And these are all points about truth that I learned from Gene's own son, Noel. There, you should feel shamed a little bit. Wow, I've never heard this before. Yeah. In any case, this is the last picture in our show. Me and, and Ken and Mary Lou in the Pike Place Market. It's almost the last picture. Let's go to the, uh, the back cover of our book, which has Paul standing atop. There he is, 1,800 columns, 40 years of history, 50, 60, how many years? I'm not sure. You, to you told me. 37. Isn't Nine, it? Well, it's 37, but it's, no. it meant so much more to us. We are the only city in the country that has an ongoing uh, record of history as such has been provided by Paul over all these decades. So let's give Paul a big hand and thank you very much. Well, here's how this is going to work tonight. You heard Gene say that we have a limited number of books. What we have here, uh, nine copies, is all we've got for now in the room tonight. And if you don't think this is a little scary, just look at our schedule for the next eight events we need to be doing in the next couple of weeks. But we are told that they may come tomorrow, they may come the next day. Anyway, they will come soon. And if you have got to get a book tonight, please get in line when we're done with the show. If you can hold off and order online, we have flyers here that have the website, but you don't even need the flyer. The flyer just tells you to go to pauldorpat.com. All of you can remember pauldorpat.com. Right up at the top of the page, there's a link where you go to the how to order page. You put in all your information. You can do it by credit card. And you can even indicate how you want these two guys to inscribe the book. And you better believe that when the books come to us, and we hope it's within a day or two, we're going to set up a marathon signing session <laughs> because we have hundreds of books already ordered and we want to get them to you before the holiday season really kicks in. Mm, I would also like to pay the printer. <laughs> ah. So tonight we can take cash, card, check, whatever you have, and we wish we had more books with us. This has been something that's been out of our control. We're six weeks late, um, later than we thought. But this is the reality we're dealing with. Just rest assured you can get a copy of the book. These are not the only ones extant. These are only, this is what's left over from the small quantity we had air freighted from China a couple of months back. The price, the price is $49.95 plus $5 tax, so basically $55. If uh, you want to put in another five cents, we have a wonderful pillow we're putting in. <laughs> and, and I appreciate Jean um, asking you to applaud Paul, but this is truly a joint process, project. And I think Gene deserves a round of applause, too. Yeah, Clay's done a little bit of work here, too. Um, Clay, thank you for bringing this back to the um, I'll tell you, I heard, I've gotten to be with these fellows a few times. Um, and one time was about a month ago when they were starting making these presentations, and I said, you have 20 something of these scheduled before you come to us. Well, you still have the energy and the humor when you come. And I appreciate that you still do. And um, it's, it's a delight to hear the, how much passion you have about Seattle and, um, and how careful you are in doing the work. I, I think um, Gene, sometimes he describes some here about trying to get the picture just right, but to get lifts in certain places, to get access to certain places, to locate the exact place that was originally. And then Paul sometimes talks about doing the research and the people that he has relied on too to um, do the work. So it's really a gift uh, that they share this. And I, I love that they can come to Horizon House and be part of this. 
Yeah. All right, I have to ask the question. None yeah. of us wants to be asked. But again, we want to we want to pay for these books, okay? How many of you are going to buy one of these books? Raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand. Come on, every one of you, get your hand up. All right, let's praise the Lord now. Give the hands up. <laughs> Not everybody, but son everybody. of the preacher. <laughs> so, um, praise the Lord. So I, I'm trying to figure this piece out because we had arranged for some people with microphones if a few people have questions. Yeah. I know we've gone, we typically do things for one hour. That's how much energy we have here at Horizon House. But um, <laughs> I thought that if a few people, is, are you willing to entertain a few questions? Oh, sure, we love you're it. Inter and also, Paul is lobbying to move to Horizon House. And he would like any of you that can help endorse his... Here. Reach into your pockets. <laughs> so, um, there, there are people with microphones. Um, okay, if, ask if away. If people have some questions. Don't trip on that thing there. Oh. I guess nobody wants to ask a question. Uh, I don't recall ever seeing this photo in your column in the newspaper, but I wonder if you had one of the Seattle downtown skyline at about the time of World War II, taken from the west, from West Seattle. The skyline was dominated by two big buildings. On the south was the Smith Tower, which you give a lot of prominence to. There was another building about the same size toward the north. Northern Life Tower. Northern Life Tower, Third University. Yeah. Did you ever print that photo? I don't. I think I've had it in a blog. That's why the importance is if you look at that article every week, you should take the instruction at the bottom of the article to visit the blog because there's about 50 times more stuff on the blog than there is in the paper. And it's can blow up, and it's colorful too. Same colors that Gene introduces, and even more. Do you think so it's go worth, to the blog. Do you think it's worth digging that out? And no, I'll help you out. You just take my address, and give me an email, and I'll find one and send it to you. No, just dig it out and put it in your column. Can you borrow the mic? No, I refuse to take editorial instructions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I might do that, I might do that. It's in one of the other now and then books. The, the first three I did from the 70s, you'll find one in there like that. We do have a present day photo of what you're describing in the book in the acknowledgement sections, but I want to show something that you may not realize otherwise. Um, we ran into a situation, and it's very much related, we ran into a situation where we had two stellar then photos and we wanted to put them in the book along with a now photo that you could compare. Well, if you imagine putting them on one regular book spread, you would have to make them postage stamp size in order to all fit. So what we did was create a gatefold. So the gatefold is in the middle of the book, and we have a photo from, this is of the downtown skyline from Queen Anne Hill. And it's from 1893, and then there's another then from 1930, and then Gene's spectacular panorama takes up two pages, and so we have this four-foot wide gatefold, which really is the centerpiece of the book. Just wanted you to be aware of that. Think of those relatives in Peoria, Illinois, <laughs> and the kids. You know, your kids, your children, for God's sake. But you ever think about your children? Well, now is the time to think about your children. <laughs> Any other questions? Was that the designated question? <laughs> They're worn out, Gene. They're worn out. Well, I suppose that's it.